because all the other stuff doesn't quite make sense to me. You know, like the other ways that, um, you know, being woke expresses itself. You know, I don't know what, what is it that you really, I want self-determination. I want self-determination for my people and all people. I know that mine won't be secure if someone else's hasn't been taken care of. So, that, you know, it's, it's a different kind of uh, struggle than simply um, learning to, relearning how to love yourself after multiple generations of being told how bad you are, how ugly you are, how this you are. We did a lot of work. I got, I got, a, I got at least one, I'm a little older than you, but I got one generational cohort in the room. And we did a lot of work in our time relearning how to love ourselves. We talked about the Afro, right? And I bet you can remember, like I can remember, I was in Cincinnati, Ohio, until about 1972, and that's when I moved to this area. And James Brown had King Studios. King Studios was based in Cincinnati, and that's where James did a lot of his reporting. That's where he hooked up with Bootsy Collins. Bootsy was in the band. Really, he brought Bootsy and Bootsy's band, the Pace Setters, to replace you know, the band that he had just fired, you know. But Bootsy was convenient and, and eager and okay in Cincinnati. So we felt in a sense like we had some claim to ownership of the Godfather of Soul, even though we knew he was from Georgia. So James used to put his, you know, those Polydor singles, that red and black label, James would put his picture, you know, on the record. And James was, you know, he was, he was rich and successful and very dark, and he was the most prominent black man for a while in entertainment, right, in this country. And James rocked his process as long as he could. When James Brown flipped and washed that crap out of his hair, everybody did. Everybody did. It was like a wave. It was like, oh, that's over. Mm. We don't do that anymore. It was over, but something didn't stick because was it 10, 15, 20 years later, right back. you're looking up and it's like, well, what's that on your mother's couch? <laughs> oh my gosh, it's very <laughs> <relaxing. laughs> That was a rough period. <laughs> my four years, and it's a hard point to make because Again, we don't have self-critical spaces to talk about. You know, it's the easiest thing in the world to poke your finger in the eye of white capitalism and white supremacy. White people do it and do it well. It's easy. But for us to get together and say, look, we've taken some directions and made some choices. Are they all good? We don't get to do that. Thank you. So to the degree that woke becomes just another way of um, style. Oh, we look good in our mud cloth and our kente cloth. To the extent that embracing our blackness is just simply another kind of swag, we should get over it. Because it ain't about self-determination. The jails are still full of our people. The worst schools are still reserved for our people. You know, this, these are facts. All right, so I'm an altered destinyist. Yeah, that's what I am. I figured out that that's what I got to just start calling myself that because that's what I am. Coming out. Oh, hear that? Yeah, I'm that. And Alter Destiny was a word that Sun Ra used to describe the Afro future. Hear people talk about Afro futurism? That was Sun Ra's idea. Alter Destiny. Now, he was the kind of genius where if you tried to pin him down, to a rebuttable set of specifics, man, he would wiggle out of that. Because that wasn't his agenda to get into like, you know, a back and forth with you over something like that. It was always about realities at the highest point. And if you said, well, is all to destiny this? Is it that? Is it this other thing? He'd say, no, it's not. It's not anything that you can really think of with your current mind. Huh? How can I do it if I can't know what it is? Well, you're going to have to figure that out. It's coming. Oh, to Destiny is in the room with us right here. This is why I value the award. You know, I see each one. This is, you, 
can't. Like I could say my stick and just walk out the door because the beauty <clears throat> of what Khalid is revealing for us is that each one of these paintings is a, a freestanding ontology. It's a window into a set of possibilities, possibilities about how to live, possibilities about how to think, feel. You can with paint and color and form and with sound and rhythm and space and tone. If you let yourself, you can tap into the multiplicity of what some of our call the omniverse. And the omniverse is a whole bunch of things that are outside of everybody's culture, beyond culture. You, know, you can't lay a claim on it any more than a Swedish person can, any more than a Japanese person can, any more than anybody can. It's beyond everybody's culture. There's a post-cultural truth that is waiting for all humanity. We talk about, um, Samurai has a line in the movie, Space is the Place, right at the beginning. Why not have a world with no white people? Now, you think about that, and you're like, yeah. Well, what does he really mean? You know, because you know, if you really are talking about, you know, um, it was a little film that uh, I remember seeing on cable a while ago. I don't know why they don't show it more often, but it starred George Clinton. It was called Cosmic Slop. Mm -hmm. You remember? Yeah, I remember that series. And they were going to put all the black people on a spaceship, spaceship and get us out of here. What was the trade for? Gold? They were going to solve everything. Right, 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 right. They were going to solve everything. So it was like, well, uh, they, they, they were to move us to a different planet. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, okay. So any idea that involves, like, you know, one group of people is going to survive and the others are going to dissolve is, is, is childish fantasy. And what frustrates me is that so often when you really try to see what people are talking about with their Afro future, it's that simplistic, it's that childish. It's that undeveloped and it's that politically immature. What we have to realize is that whiteness is, always has been, and only can be a myth. It's a myth. It's shifted, its borders have shifted and vacillated over time depending on the interest of imperialism. When they were Italians, when they needed Italians to not be white, they weren't white. They were, they were um, what's the term they use, man? Swarthy. Swarthy. They're swarthy Italians. They're not quite niggas, but they're not quite white either. And that Roman Catholicism, my gosh, that's practically like, you know, they're Mauritius. I mean, they got incense and everything. Ah! Shifts and changes, shifts and changes the definition of who's white, who's white. Got melanin. They got melanin. Just not as much. Not as much. I don't have as much. You don't have as much as some cat. I saw a cat like you know a Dinka brother coming out of the restroom at Starbucks with the scarification. No he was blacker than my tires. No <laughs> I ain't competing with him on black. <laughs> we need to come down off of that stuff because where I'm at with Alter Destiny is I feel like we've run out of lies that are operational. That's the whole thing that's happening in politics right now. It was always built on falsehood, but they were operational falsehoods. We've run out of lies that'll work well for us. And now we gotta really, you know, gotta put on your big boy shoes and you gotta deal with this. Because what I'm sensing in the current time is the possibility to change a lot of things all at once in the right direction and everybody benefits. If you, you've got to be like just the most alienated, dark hearted, sadistic, you know, really messed up person to not have an investment in, in where this planet is ultimately going to land. You've got to be really messed up and they're not, I don't know, I mean maybe we do. I mean 45 is pretty messed up. A lot of that generation is dying out. A lot of those people and, and that boneheaded you know, mentality, a lot of it is just dying out. But things are poised, you know, a quantum condition of uncertainty. Things are poised to collapse in one direction or another. 
Now, in Altered Destinies, I don't know, I'm going to ask you some questions. Oh, no, I'm going to give my intro down. Okay, no, absolutely. In Altered Destinies, is a particular kind of optimist. George Clinton had an album title that he never used called Up South. Up South. Up South. Up South. Up South. He used to say Down South, right? Yeah, up South. Yeah, he used to say Up South. Well, I know the, the, the Nile, of the Nile is a southern direction. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nile, yeah. Evolution. 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 Sometimes things fall off. Sometimes a change that in any other context would be a, I mean, a mutation is a mutation, right? Sometimes a change that in any other context would be a problem, if it hits reality in the right way, it's an adaptation, and you move forward based on that change. You know, the first, the first proto-human, and I like evolution as a model. It's a beautiful way to talk about change biologically and non-biologically. I don't have any problems with it. It doesn't collide with my spirituality. I like evolution. Darwin was a racist. Darwin was smart. Of dead body. All right. Sometimes the adaptation hits the conditions in just the right way. We're like, wow, the first proto-human to stand upright and get up off those knuckles, he might have had a deformity, but it was a deformity that allowed him to see, well, I'm, I'm doing bad, I don't want to go back on my knuckles. But you're not like us. You're not like us. This is how we do it. Well, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to, I want to do what's next. I walk into a room full of people, say, ooh, my people. My people are the hyper-creative people that are ready for what's next. This will not last. It's perishing all around us. Optimism is accepting that this shit is destined to be ruins, just like the Colosseum, just like all those beautiful buildings that the pharaohs were in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, beautiful buildings. Ain't much now. Hey, it's still there. It too will pass. <laughs> so we can be. Termites or carpenters. For him, he's got a brother, and they, they got two sisters. I'm a little bit of a termite, y'all. Mm -hmm. This mansion is made out of damp wood. It's rotting from the bottom up, and I'm chewing. I'm chewing. I'm not a violent man. I don't really, you know, I sold my gun because, I, you know, I didn't want anything else. There was. You know, it seemed like, what are the chances that I actually use this to, like, repel the clan, or that it falls into the hand, my own hands or somebody else's hands on the worst day of our lives? That's terrible. I don't want that. Get this out of my house. I can do better. So I use my art as a kind of solvent. You know, you, you throw the, the solvent on their reality. And there is a vague term. It's not really just a white term. It's like everybody that's invested so much into the hallucination that is normality. Right. And you throw this solvent on it, and as the solvent runs down, my gosh, Khalid's paintings are on the other side of this. <laughs> These worlds are on the other side of this. And that's why I think you're a valuable human being. I think that's why you are, I mean, you're a great guy, you're a great father. But your value here in terms of this war is what you can do with these windows into all of these different universal possibilities. And I wanted to start our conversation by asking you, and you're standing in front of your father and your sister, which puts the pressure on you <laughs> to talk about where are these proclivities, where are these abilities, where are these insights and perspectives originate in your life history. Well, the first time I can say I started really feeling what I like to call like the force of the spirit was when my sister and I were kids and we would go down to my grandmother, his mother, my father's mother's house. Where was she from? Well, Newport News, Virginia. Okay. So that's where my father's originally from. And um, my grandmother, Ernestine Thompson, she goes to a church called the House of Prayer. And, um, the House of Prayer, like as we know, the, a lot of the origins of black music, at least in the contemporary sense, came from the black church. So in certain communities, you know, black communities emphasize creative expression in the church more than others. 
And the House of Prayer made a strong emphasis on music and improvisation and expression and using the creative force of, and even the art of the way that people dress there, because it's a, a, an attention to detail on a visual level, as well with the pageantry of the dress, the pageantry of the, of, of, of the ceremonies that they have. And a lot of those of it's rooted in, in, in African spiritualities and, and, and spiritualities of the diaspora that were affected by British rule here, that you know are south of here, you know, as Central and South America. But you see that dynamic in the house of prayer. And I was a small kid going there, and we just went to church with my grandmother. She was like a lot of black grandmothers. She went to Bible study. She went to church on Sunday. We were there all day. And I remember me and my sister, our favorite part is when they would randomly get up and start clapping their hands and hit that tambourine and sing the song. And you know, that was just the moments of just going to the church to experience that. And then they have these big convocations. And then it's like going to a party to fuck another concert. It's insane. The visual, the visualization, the, the pageantry, the, the spirit, the soul. You, you feel something. And I just, I felt like then, like I feel like what happened with a lot of black musicians and a lot of black artists, those early experiences just shape the way you feel about life. They really give you an insight to how rhythm, and I don't just mean musical, but I mean like rhythm can awareness of pattern, awareness of pattern and time, how it can give you the ability to adapt and adjust in your environment. And actually, um, there's a term in Capoeira Angola, which is an Af African original um, martial art that developed in Brazil. It was like a I guess you could say like a convergence of different martial arts within the Gold Coast and parts of West Africa that developed into a form of system, you know, defense system in, in on the shores of Bahia, Brazil. But they have this concept called Manjina. And in the game of Capoeira, it's played in a circle. You have two players and you sit in the bateria, which is basically a musical band that charges up the space and invites the players to move in the space because rhythm is such an important part of our culture. A lot of three. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. A lot of three point rhythms and stuff like that. So what happens in order is Manjinga is the yeah. opponent's ability to misdirect their opponent. So they may smile while they're playing, but they're really setting you up. They may, you know, because a lot of it was to fool the overseers, the Portuguese, you know what I'm saying, slave masters and overseers, and to make it look like a dance, like a waltz. But reality was a form of defense that they needed to use when necessary. So Manjiga, the whole concept of playing your opponent, using situations, rhythm, style, surface, to mystify and hypnotize them. But you're sending a deeper message. You're saying, like, you don't know, but I already know you. I already see you and I'm seeing through you and ahead of you. That's why I'm playing it like this. You think I'm set up, I'm acting a fool. You think that I'm just getting by. You think that I'm just a Christian. You think that I'm just a Muslim. You think that I'm just gonna take what you're colonizing me with and accept it as that face value, you put your face on it and just roll with that. But no, that's not what's happening. This is a survival mechanism. It has roots that go back to when we first sold ourselves to the Europeans. You see what I'm saying? Like. Yeah, this, this is our culture that, this is our story. They're kind of like auxiliary to that, on the periphery of it. But we're looking to, to, to the periphery and not looking inside of our culture to answer these questions and these drives. But to go back to what I'm saying is, is that the whole concept of African expression, and diasporic expression that I experienced at the House of Prayer, let me know that we use rhythm, we do style, our own cultural impulse to make something beautiful and we turn it into a survival mechanism and that gives us the ability to hypnotize other cultures and mask not only hypnotize them with what we express but master their idiom, master their ideas and and so that tradition to me was important it was something in just getting up and saying he got the whole world in his hands and, and then going up and doing confessions and testimonies and everything being about the rhythm and chanting and calling Do you, do you remember the first time that, that you painted anything? Do you remember the first time that you did more than that? You know, we all yeah. do scribble and draw and paint right. as part of our early education, but right. do you remember the first time painting meant a little more than that to you? Right. Well, the first 
I, you know, I tried art as a kid and it always drawn a script, like you said, coming up. But the, I'll tell you the time that I first felt like actual painting. So whereas before I might have tried it, but this time it felt like a genuine need to transmit something. And that's when I moved here. I ran into an artist who's from uh, the Ivory Coast by the name of Shreya Mullen. And um, he, uh, the way he expressed himself in art, it's like he had just fused the African spirit into the visual medium. And he expressed it in such a way that was so audacious and so open and so freeing. You could tell this was his only portal to the Kaaba. This was his only connection. Because in those moments, he was completely liberated. And something about seeing that expression inspired me to want to try to, instead of just drawing like I used to do, explore the painting medium and try different forms of paint. And um, when I started working with paint and I started understanding color and the possibilities of it, I realized that it's just like notes or chords, or it's just like the way you dress. How do you style your shit? That's what we do best. But see, they don't understand the brilliance of that. You know what I'm saying? And that's why it's always over their heads until it's commercially viable. Then everybody jumps on You see what I'm saying? But the fact is, is that the magic is always happening. It doesn't matter whether you're on the basketball court. It doesn't matter whether you're standing on the podium or on the political stage. There's something about the swing, the rhythm. And this is a cultural identity that isn't always even associated with all black people. And it shouldn't be, but it's the thrust of our culture. Because remember, we are, we're now learning to operate in a different cultural system. So that in its own way creates separation in certain regards to how we experience culture. But in essence, with black culture, it's important that we see ourselves as limitless beings experiencing human life like anybody else and not imprisoned by this so-called myth of blackness. You know, so for me, I'm I'm not politically pan-African. I'm I'm living pan-Africanism. And I understand the division and I understand why they set it up that way. And I get it. So for me, I don't deal with it. If we're doing black things around the world, if we look at our history, if we look at the stories of what we've created, what we've done, and we're willing to take those stories and actually believe in them. Because Malcolm X said, and rest in peace to Malcolm, because he was assassinated yesterday, That's right. 1965. And it's important to understand, he said, you know, when I tell you about your history, you know, blow me off. What if a white man tells you, it's valid. Now all of a sudden it's got its stamp. It's got its subconscious stamp. He's hit you with the whip psychologically. And you've submitted to him as the authority, whether you even know it or not. And it's a tricky obstacle to navigate. And I think Manjinga, I think rhythm, I think a sensibility of understanding that you can explain your blackness and you can hypnotize them and you can almost revitalize their spirit and I'm talking about other cultures, about the possibility of what it is to be human through expressing your own blackness with rhythm and style and grace because it's undeniable. It's undeniable when you make it. Was there a point when you were, so you, you know, you, you're on the path now. Was there a point when you're moving down that path where your paintbrush started to feel like that tambourine? Yeah, you really felt like you were yeah, yeah, yeah. It really started happening when I started delving into primarily like abstract expression. And um, using the momentum of what I was listening to when I was listening to jazz records, or I like to say black classical music, you know what I'm saying, or Afro classical music. But I was listening to the way that these men and women were overlaying these rhythms and these melodies and doing it in such a way that it, 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 it defied logic. It, it was it, it was from the experience of listening to it's about the experience, the feeling of the music. And I wanted to convey that through color. Like I feel like a lot of artists have done in our community, like Ruby Bearden, you know, Jack Whitten is a prime example of taking color and doing what, you know, musicians do with sound. And so that there's a relationship when your ears and your eyes are on the same level. So the audio visual experience 
is really a unifying experience. You mentioned from your period of a great collage artist um, probably being able to do his craft today with the way the copyright is handled all that, whatever. But you also mentioned Jack Whitten, who is a new figure to me, and maybe you can talk a little bit more about the camera other people. Yeah, Jack Whitten was originally from Bessemer, Alabama. Um, he went to Tuskegee to study, uh, I think he went to med school in Tuskegee. He had always been interested in art, but his family, you know, being of the black tradition, you know, what was important was, you know, getting your degree in a field of engineering or business or entrepreneurship, because, you know, for black people at that time, we were more so like artists, like, what are you talking about? So he tried to follow that narrative, and then he decided to go to Louisiana to get involved in, um, political activities during the early 60s, and some situations happened down there that really frightened him. The level of violence really, it shocked him, man, you know? And um, he decided that he was gonna to move to New York City. So he moved to New York City, and he went to Cooper Union, which is an arts and design school in New York. And um, for the first time in his life, like we hear with a lot of you know, Afro-Americans that went to Paris during the Harlem Renaissance, he felt like he was in a situation where he was able to immerse himself in art, and at least in the artist circles, because a lot of you know people don't know that like America is an import culture. So you know everybody that moves here, all of a sudden they're American, we want to promote our values and our ideas to the world. So we got a lot of European artists like Malik Kuni, we got some American artists like Jackson Pollock, and artists like Norman Lewis, who I want to definitely talk about and mention. And he was you know in New York at the time experiencing this abstract movement and learning about, you know, the dynamism and self-expression of, of, of visual art, but at the same time, going to see Coltrane, going to see Thelonious Monk, going to see Miles Davis, going to see these musicians, having discussions with Coltrane, asking them about the possibilities of sound and the possibilities of existence, and using this information. He's naturally seeing the development of black culture in a city and had its impact on other cultures in New York, you know, which was undeniable to him. So he started a relationship with Norman Lewis, who was one of the preeminent abstract expressionists to come out of that era, but because of racism, didn't get the coverage and the respect that he did. But Jack Whitten always says that to him, abstraction is a distillation process. It's like people, it's like we're dealing with the essence of what's going on. So we want people to look at our work subjectively or experience it. We want to just try to make sense of it. But Jack Whitten is an incredible artist in that he understood the fundamentals of color and how it relates to sound and how you can extend the narrative of the black cultural experience, especially in the avant-garde sense, especially the jazz sense, onto a wall in a way that expresses it on a high quality level and can transmit the same form of spiritual insight or creative insight into people. But because it is, you know, institutionalization of arts, it's made it more difficult for that to occur. And that's part of one of my motivations as an artist and why I deal specifically with abstraction, why artists like Norman Lewis, Sam Gilliam, Jack Whitten, and Humble Thomas, why they chose abstraction. First of all, Sam Gilliam, right here in Alabama. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we got David Driscoll, we have a lot of uh, art, and I just, University yeah, I just, um, I just went to a show um, at the Zenith Gallery, and there's this artist called Alexander, 90 years old, and he was a part of the Washington Color School, which of course, on the surface, looks like it's a predominantly white established movement that came out in the 60s in Washington, D.C. Now, um, Carl Alexander was working with an artist, Kenneth Young, um, was working with artists such as Gene Davis, all black artists who were involved in the Color School, working with these other white artists and creating this movement, which fundamentals were about the emphasis of color. And, and, and how you apply that to the negative space of the surface that you're using, primarily canvas. But I went to go see his work, and what amazed me is that, you know, people don't even know that black people were involved in all these movements, artistically speaking. Abstraction, in the Western sense, of painterly abstraction, its main influence was African. You know, Pablo Picasso, Modigliani, all of them, if you look at pictures of their studios back in the early 20th century, it was African, yeah, they were obsessed with it. Paul Clay went to Morocco, stayed in North Africa for several years, and the colors and the tones and the dress of the people started affecting their work. They started thinking about um, 
Wassily Kandinsky is a Russian artist who was also tapping into um, you know, art from the Orient, from Africa. They were finding that that in the traditional Western sense, just to replicate what's visible doesn't necessarily give you the soul, the emphasis of what is there. It's like what's beneath the surface. And this is what's deep about African culture, primarily Western African culture, because if we're talking in their historical context, maybe most of our ancestors are from there. But what I'm getting is, is that with African culture, instead of replicating what's real, put your own spin on it, because then you carve out your own identity in the universe. This universe is an identity. It's a concept that operates on certain principles. By you doing that yourself and saying, I'm not going to replicate, but I'm going to express what motivates me internally from this experience and put something original out, you're adding to the possibilities now of what can exist. You're expanding on what's possible. And this is what European painters were getting when they were looking at African sculpture and African printwork. They were looking at it and they were like, oh, so you mean to tell me I don't have to get this nose right? I don't have to do any of that? I can paint something that originates from my experience? When I, because I deal with improvisation as um, frequently with students. And of course the first thing that I have to break down in them is the assumption that the improvised work is lacking in skill or craft relative to the non improvised Right. And I was wondering if you could address that, because I don't, I see what you're doing is very full of craft. Oh, yeah, in, in, in improvisation, it was funny you say that, because this artist, uh, Ania Khan Dofa, uh, was a fantastic artist, a muralist in the area, he came to see the live painting last night. Um, and uh, I did a live painting here with Afro Soul, you know, and much peace and love and respect to him. And, um, you know, but Iacom was just like looking at the painting and he was just like, man, you know, people, when they think you, when they look at your painting, they think it's random, but I see there's so much order in this. And what people forget is that improvisation is the seed of our omniscience, universal omniscience to me. You know, but people perceive it as, oh, if you, and this is a cultural dismissive statement, by the way. It's absolutely you know what I'm saying? Like they're doing that and they're saying like, oh, any kind of cultures that involve themselves with that aren't really creating anything. You know what I'm saying? They aren't really using any logic. No, they're not relying on dry logic to create something with substantial effect. They're not, they're not relying on dry logic. They're not stripping things down in order to impose their own will on nature. They're receiving nature and the information they get from nature and they're allowing that nature to work within them, and then they see the connection, they feel the connection. That's what rhythm is about. Nature is You just start clapping, you know? Just start clapping, yeah. Just start clapping, yeah. There's no forest in the world. Yeah, no, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, so it's important, so improvisation for me, even when I'm developing my studio, it comes from the visions that I receive spontaneously through the work. I apply the same principle because that's a rich heritage. That is really developed in jazz and blues and field songs. You're just out there picking cotton, or you're out there working on the rail tracks, and you get a rhythm, and you hear it. Next thing you know, your brother's is humming and singing, and you're working the line. But this is the type of stuff that is so, uh, how can I say it? It's so replete in our culture. It's just, you know, it's, it, it, just, it just, it oozes out of it. So it, it, it shouldn't really be, this work shouldn't be a surprise. This is 21st century avant-garde black abstraction. This is what the times are telling me and how I'm expressing it in the similar forms that it was expressed in earlier generations. And leadership is ahead of its time. Yeah. You know, leadership is tomorrow. And the other stuff is accessible because it's today and yesterday. Right. You can study it because it's already, you know, been done. Been done. Right. You are. Um, you know, I'm looking at the large works. I'm looking at the small works. And I'm thinking that in any of these, there are so many different visible acts that have been, you know, captured. You know, there's a, there's a thing that you did with your arm, hand, and body that is left to mark. And some of the marks you know I know, and the people know, I guess, that you don't see everything that goes down on the canvas because it gets covered up. Right. 
So I'm trying to get a feel, an inside out feel, a, a phenomenological feel for what your process is in the, in the, in the whirlwind of all those decisions, all of those actions that have to flow out of your body. Right. And I'm trying to get you to talk about that because I want to know if, it, if, if it's anything like what happens with me when I'm improvising electronic music. Right. So <clears throat> for me, it's like a buildup. Like I literally, it's like I see the canvas, it's this negative space, and I literally have a vision of how to go about it. So it'll be like, okay, your big brush and add some black. Big strokes, not small strokes. I have paintings tell me that, but big strokes because what I end up doing is I layer the work and I allow some of that negative space to breathe. I want that black to be back there to still emphasize the dynamism that's going on in the work. So I want there to constantly, I don't want the improvisation You know, it, like Piat Mondrian, which is a um, early 20th century modernist and abstractionist from Europe, talked about motion and stillness. And my paintings, I want them to resonate. I want, to, I want there to be such a link between the vibrations of sound, the vibrations of light that people stop the stage. But not just, you know, not for the pure surface of like trying to turn art into music or music into art, but to show that there's a deeper continuity going on. turned being an auto mechanic into a heart, or they've turned doing this into a heart. It's just another word for finding a rhythm. But when those colors come to me, it's a communicative language I'm having with the universe. Like I'm allowing the earth to give you real time information and I'm applying it. I'm trusting the creation of this universe, which I can't really put a hold of what it is that created us. Whatever it is, it's creating us. It's not just, I created you. We're growing, and then we die. And then our legacy lives on. There's a constant part of creation. So I tend to use the word creation because that's a universal process that applies to everything. It's, you can say it's scientific, you can say it's religious, but it's what's always happening. And through linking up with that intuitive process of nature, I see there's an intelligence when I see the schemes of clouds in the sky and the way the air moves with that, that's precision. You know, that's when something falls off of a shelf, that's the way it was set up to happen. Because are we falling up or down? Do we really know? Do we really know what time is? Why, why are we trying to use our brains, which are built for certain functions, to overfunction in certain ways? Whatever happened to just feeling something? Whatever happened to just removing all the social isms and schisms that are designed to make you appropriate your impulse? Why can't you express that impulse? But realizing I'm not talking about just being reckless and audacious and being disrespectful to other people in other situations, because the universe is being disrespectful by giving us day and night. It's sustaining life. It's creating a harmony production and destruction for a purpose of maintaining something. That, to me, is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about improvisation. I'm talking about working with the nature of the moment. Like, there's an um, artist who really was inspiration for me by the name of Jackson Pollock. And he was asked by one of his contemporaries, Hans Hoffman, who was an artist that came from Europe, and he kind of introduced a lot of uh, American modernists to abstraction. And Hans Hoffman had always referenced nature. So when he was talking to Jackson Pollock in Jackson Pollock's studio, he was looking at his work and he was saying, you know, you should work from nature, you know what I'm saying, artists work from nature, because that was the tradition that Hoffman had grown up in in Europe. And Pollock turned to him and said, I am nature. <laughs> I am nature. What are you talking about? Work from nature, I am nature. So you're saying that a tree is more important than me and I should observe it rather than observe or experience what's going on inside of me. And that's to me what the bedrock of improvisation is about. And that's what I love about Black and Delic AD, Alter Destiny, sonic and visual improvisation, movement improvisation, dress improvisation. If you're tuning into the right frequencies, 
You're not doing it for the sake of, like you said, being fashionable. You're doing it for the sake of trying to evolve possibility for people to know that I can create positivity in a numerous amount of ways. It doesn't have to be like this. There's possibilities with that. That is endless. You know, that, was, that, was, that was very wonderful. That was, you know, and so my work is to put you in a moment and an experience. You know, there's a lot going on in the work because there's a lot going on in life. But it's not a bunch of confusion on the walls. It's about a black man or a man that's labeled black operating in a system that is telling him to be everything but that. And then deciding, well, the way I'm gonna take my stance, the way you're gonna have to run over me is with my art. Because the art will always last. That's the cultural link. That's what I can give to another generation of young black artists or young black people to look to and say, hey, this kid did it. I can do it and take it somewhere else. Because the, 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 the war zone is really here. And you know, it's getting to a point now where weapons are becoming useless. <laughs> They're just becoming pointless. Because once they found out after 1945 what they could do with atomic energy, what they can really do, they had to say, well, this is not, if we do this, we'll destroy our only possibility of existence. So even though their numbers are, their fingers are always by the button, they know that if they press it, they can destroy every possibility of existence. So we have limits, and we have to work within those limits to destroy those limitations and move on from this paradigm of oppressive, destructive, forceful, you know, of, of systematic oppression. I mean, I, so for me, art is about liberating my people and showing them that you are a universe within yourself, which is what Bob Marley said. You know, man is a universe within himself, woman is a universe within himself. And what you're seeing is a universe of possibilities. What you're seeing is you black should work, spiritual you should work less valuable for someone who comes from a different tradition, heritage, life experience, or lineage, you know what I mean? Like you're, you're, you're asserting very, um, very, very much a connection of your work and its value to what a black viewer could get out of it. What about everybody else? Yeah. I, and, and I'll tell you that, because my experiences with uh, viewers of other culture are the same. Because, and that's why I think I focused on the visual medium. Because seeing is believing. No matter what you see, and our eyes, our objects are designed to see color and form. It's like it becomes experiential. You like you're experiencing it versus imagining it. When the painting's in front of you, you have to deal with what you see. And if you see the appropriation of color, you see balance of color, you see balance of form. That's all the artist or viewer sees. So I have people that are not black that look at the work and are just as impacted by it because the principles that I'm applying are universal with color and with the intention of design. You know, so they might not even see some of the inlaid African images, but it doesn't matter because they're looking at the galaxy of colors and dots and lines that are just totally about experience. Totally about it. So the painting isn't just about what I'm hiding. It's about what you see too. Every level operates and maybe certain viewers get different things from it. But I think with the visual media, some people just from a design perspective um, that are of other cultures uh, dig that. And some of them dig the cultural parts of it too. You know, if they're aware, they're too with the, the history of what's been going on. Some of your pieces can be read, some, a minority of your pieces really can be read as, well, this was probably done by a black artist. Right. Most of them cannot. And um, I think, and who am I to say, push me, um, you know, there's a lot of pandering. There's a lot of pandering by black artists to black audiences. There's a lot of, uh, oh man, you know, Wakanda. And I like the maturity that your approach is reflecting with respect to that whole thing. You know, like it's what it is, 
I'm black. I did it. It's the black experience. Now, I want to tell you, I had a thing, and Will Stewart can vouch for me. This was an experience where I was invited. Why was I invited over there? And it was a community center up, um, run by Baba Lumumba, who uh, I'm not going to diss because I understand he's having some health crises. And we were doing a thing with young people, and it was Kwanzaa, and it was musically related. And um, I had to go pick up my son. And while I was away, and then I brought my son back, Baba Lumumba went into this long tirade about how Jimi Hendrix was not a part of the black continuum of musical culture. And you know, he, he's a guy that will show you his um, bona fides, they call him, you know, his letters when he was a panther and his, you know, his, and you know, he's done his part and he's, you know, he's, he's not an, 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 an unvaluable person for all he's given to struggle. And yet I didn't think he had the authority to push Jimi out of the black tradition. When Jimmy was doing what he had to do artistically, and the black tradition didn't want it. They were like, we want Motown, baby. We like the suits and the other thing. You stand in there with two white boys in the back, that shit is loud. But Jimmy was like, you know. And this was, if we study Hendrix's biography, this is one of the things that he um, struggled with personally, that he didn't want to be alienated from what black people were doing. And he saw his work, it's like, I'm black, and it's a black, you know, it's, what do you mean it's not part of the black community? How do you deal with that? Do you have any of that in you emotionally? And how do you deal with it? Because how do you know I got it? Right, right. You know? No, no, absolutely. Um, when you operate out of the edifices that have been built for black people, you know what I mean, like the social edifices, you know, like this is what it is to be black. Or Didn't we build some of those healthy? Yeah. And we're just built by white people. Oh, no, 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 no. We definitely built them. That's what I'm <laughs> more so talking to our, our, our call. I mean, and the system media helps to filter them out to people and, and kind of give us narrow representations. So in that sense, a larger cultural part of it. But no, because we've had such a pressurized social political experience, especially since post-reconstruction, um, we really have kind of created our own division lines as far as what is black. Like we've kind of created these ideas as to what is black. And that's something that like with Sun Ra, and that's why Sun Ra is so important, it's like, that's a myth. Like this whole, like you were just mentioning about whiteness being a myth, so is the concept of blackness being a myth. You know what I'm saying? Okay, cool. Um, so, so, you know, essentially what I'm trying to share with people in general or with black people is that you're so much more, and if you give yourself the opportunity to free yourself from your own self-imposed labels of what is supposed to be is it supposed to be black, then you'll find out that your blackness is humanity in essence. Your blackness is humanity. It is not, you're a human being. Yet he put words called black over your experience. Don't be trapped by that. Don't be imprisoned by that. Matter of fact, appropriate wherever, but use your expression of culture, whatever it is that comes out of you, to connect to humanity, the larger humanity. You know, and to to rewrite your story in your own mind. So, a lot of my work, and that's why I layer it, and that's why I make suggestive hints to some of the images, the mixed media images that are overtly African, rather than just putting them right out there. Because how much of that really matters in the larger sense, since what history has done. You know, sometimes I think we focus too much on what's going on across the Atlantic, rather than what's been built right here our own people, you know what I'm saying? And if anything, start here, work your way back to Africa. Appreciate what you got here. For a brother to say, with all due respect to the brother, um, and, all, and, all, and all due respect to his opinions, you know, we, through understanding how to articulate ourselves in society, are just reflecting a lot of the values that were imposed on us um, by our oppressive system. And we try to find liberation using their dynamics. You know, we get extra militant, we get extra misogynist, we, get, we take their religions and then we use their perverted perspectives and just put black over it and add black rituals, but it's the same thing because we're not really dealing with different spaces, or our, our particular perspective on space and time when we're doing that. I was talking to my father earlier about that, you know, and the art of that and how it's an instinctive art. And 
tell them about the difference of like typically when you see so-called, you know, European cultured individuals. How are you doing? What's going on? Hey, how are you? But the way we do it is we gotta spend five minutes <laughs> pumping and growing and pounding and flipping and flapping and doing all that because we're experiencing time different. Because the importance of feeling and rhythm and just feeling a person's vibe is important. And it's important to take time to do that. You know, that's a part of our culture, but a lot of times what we do is because we wear the straight jacket of European psychology, especially of British origin, of British elitist origin, we're told to sit straight, act proper, be this, be that. That was a stage we had to do that, because if we didn't, we'd die, depending on where you lived. If you got too black, you had to figure out ways to survive. But that was so we could get to a point to where we could be unashamedly, you know, Afro in our expression. We can be unashamed. Yeah. You know, so Luna, the uh, herbal shop. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Our father runs that is uh, Tuku. And Father Tuku took my wife, Mom Paula, to her first summer concert. And, I, you know, I've kind of known him off and on since, um, you know, college, a long time ago. We've been filming him for a long time. I was talking to him really. Uh, I want to say about a year ago, maybe 18 months ago, and he had made a trip to Benin. And he said, you, you don't understand, when the people there meet each other, they say a prayer to each other. It's not a greeting. It's they take time to pray to the divinity that's in the person that they're looking in the eye. That's the You get a culture like that, You know, what does that do for empathy? What does that do for processes of peace in the community? What does that do for, you know, just everything, you know? It has to be different if people are taking the time to respect each other at such a deep level like that. I want to pull this towards the person. You've been paying attention. You know, like through your life, I can tell. You've been paying attention. You haven't been coasting. You've been paying attention. We both have the dual edge challenge of raising sons, males, who are African up in this piece called the United States of America. Their lives are imperiled by a system that fears their power, their individuality. You know, it's got it's got all sorts of remedies from Ritalin to jail cells and worse. We gotta get through that phase. We also are mature men who have an understanding of the karma that maleness has taken on. In all cultures since the beginning of time, it's the oldest war in the world. Black folks got upset. John Lennon did a song called Woman is the Nigger of the World. And it's like, oh, you can't say that. Feel. But you know, he's right. He's right. You know, the first law, the first injustice was rape. What do we do, Bob? Because you got answers. And I need some answers. <laughs> There's nothing easy about this thing. No, I think I think um, honestly, um, like, and I'm not a, a fan, so to speak, of Gandhi. I don't like to, you know, I know, you know, I, but I'm gonna use his statement because I think it's an important statement. I don't have anything personally against Gandhi or his teaching, but he says, be the change in the world you wish to see. And, you know, like what we have to understand is that if we feel connected to this life, then your change is change in the world that can reverberate. Um, I don't think like, like uh, you know, Adrian, my man Adrian Ferguson, Art of Noise, and I, I want to definitely thank him for providing this space for, for me and giving me my first like real legitimate solo show and providing the platform and supporting, you know, uh, like-minded people like myself, providing for black off guard, because it's, it's individuals like him who get the vision and understand that it needs to be seen and addressed. So he's a part of the creative movement. He's an artist in mind and in, in, in spirit, the way that he values black creativity. So I definitely want to give him a major shout out and support. He's been an awesome part of the work with the support system a lot of work for the last year. But um, not to get too off track, but I this is my time on earth, physically.
do I do with that time? What did our ancestors do when they were on the fields? Did they place themselves, well, here I am, this is it? This is all I can do? I just got to be a slave? Or did they say, this is my time. I'm going to plan my escape. This is my time. I'm going to figure out a way to learn how to read. This is my time. I'm going to go ahead and let Master Dan. I'm just a good old slave. I'm playing this real stuff. <laughs> We're right. planning a rebellion right now. He don't even know it. You know what I'm saying? Like, what am I going to do? Because instinctively, we think about posterity. Instinctively, whether we know it or not, a lot of the things we do, children are observing. Yeah. I want my son to know as a black man in this world that he has no limitations and he has no fear and feels like he doesn't have to appropriate or bow down to the oppressive system. Your culture is your freedom. You live for that, die for that. You know, and it's important that you stand on that because so many of us are willing to back off and accommodate and make white people happy because we're scared to death of them. And that fear paralyzes people from really thinking, well, Dad, what's wrong with, what's wrong with the way my people look? What's wrong with my hair? What's wrong with, yeah, I want to wear a kente cough. You know, I'm, my ancestors are from Africa. How does that offend you? It only offends the system when they're telling you that your culture's a threat. If you're aware of your culture and you're empowered by your culture, and Elaine Locke talks about this, you know about Elaine Locke. He's a Baha'i You know what I'm saying? Yeah, awesome. Big, Baha'i. Great, great. big ups to Baha'i, big ups to, to Elaine Locke. My sister Camilla. I feel that. Yeah. And, and, and he, um, and you know, he was about focusing on, other than like I was explaining to them earlier, uh, W.B. Du Bois, who was about politics, and Booker T. Washington was about military work valuing our cultural expression, like finding joy in expressing the realities of being black, which is also, which is mostly taught to be awkward in our society. You know, we gotta keep that stuff because we don't understand it. We're not doing it for you. We're doing it for us. <laughs> yeah. If we didn't ask you to show up and give your ideas, why is it a threat to you so much? You know why? Because people root for the underdog. And we're the underdog globally. Americans here in particular are the underdog globally. That's why our art reaches far and wide. That's why anything we do that is parallel to what white people have been doing for generations in their system, when we do it, everybody pays attention. Because we're the underdog. So it's our responsibility to lift our culture up. Not just here, but from a pan-global perspective. And not just black people, but people in general. I'm not trying to create some universalist thing so everybody can be accepted. No, that's, I'm not going to admit my culture for you to make it easier for you. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to become this neutralized, multicultural person with European appropriations all around it. You know, I'm not that coffee shop dude. You know what I'm saying? Like, no. This is what you get. Can you keep up? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Can you keep up? I like that. You know what I'm saying? So, you don't let them feel a way about it, but the juju's on the walls. The juju is coming from the sonic vibrations of what this brother represents. And this is a working with artists such as you and Luke Stewart, who understand, you know, the tradition of Amir Baraka, brothers and sisters who understood how important it was to not just replicate African art and be American to do that, but take our unique experience and use that as an existential catapult human connections to life. Yeah. We're expressing our humanity and you're damning us for it. Do we have the problem? Or do you have the problem? So this isn't a middle finger. This is just this is who I am and I'm damn proud of it. I love my culture. I love world culture. I love culture. Cultures that come from all parts of the world. I don't have beef with people even if their views are different. If you treat me like a human being, I'm going to treat you like a human being. Because first and foremost, that's what you are. And my experiences in the black avant-garde community have allowed me to realize that, my humanity, and using improvisational forms as a connective tissue to real organic life that goes beyond the separation of ideologies and labels. Because that's what art should do. It should, I mean, unless you want to be political about it, then you just stay on that vibration. What we're trying to do 
Thomas is really important, but what your destiny is to reshape that. Like you, your destiny is really what you make it into. And how, but how can we do that and be black? And be proud to be black. I mean, we're very proud of it. And so my story just adds on to the myth. And my each work is a myth. You have to look inside of it to see yourself. You have to stay back to see yourself. So, you know, with that in mind, you know, we can wrap it up shortly. Um, you know, that's what this is about. You know, it's about the traditions of jazz, it's about the traditions of blackness, being with the law, but in a very creative way as to continue to cause the viewer to always re-examine and re-reference their position when they're experiencing looking at the art and hopefully their position. And so the work is is not still Shakespeare. And that's what Jimi Hendrix was doing. Jimi Hendrix was doing that. He was saying, black people, don't let them tell you who you are. You ain't just, that's funky. Everything. Are you okay with that? Or did they whitewash it enough to make you not want to be bothered with it? That's what they did. It's a black music. You listen to who do the Beatles worship? Robert Johnson. Who does Eric Clapton and all them talk about? When we went to England, I say we, we were talking about Jimmy. We went and we blew their minds. They were seeing what is the real essence of rock and roll music. They need to see what the real essence of art is. So what I want to do is follow in those traditions visually. You know, and not use, and not just stay limited to, oh, black, black, because we're black. No, no, let's blow the whole ceiling. Let's, we're talking sun, moon, stars. We're talking earthy. We're talking about something that's way bigger than a little trivial skirmish as we get in in our ideologies. It's way more than that. So in traditions of what my brother's been doing and artists like himself and you know, the men with that, I just want to carry on that tradition and I just want to add that visual component because that tradition, this tradition right here of black artists, this rich tradition is overlooked because under the institutionalization of art in general, from the common man, black artists who work and operate in those fields are also removed. And if they're further pigeonholed, then you don't even know they exist. So it's it's definitely not just about the work, it's about the tradition. The artists that you said you would talk about, you never got to today. The Jack Norman. Norman, Norman Lewis, uh, who was primary in abstract expressionism, uh, had been doing abstract work since the 30s and 40s and was involved in the social discussions of a lot of the famous abstract expressions of the time. So I just mentioned Jackson Pollock, I mentioned Mark Rothko, Marshall Gorky, all these artists. He was at the round table, just pictures of them. But when you look through the history of abstract expressionism, you do not see it. And as of recent, because of uh, the art market and it's uh, very uh, seditious focused ability to take niches and make money off of them. But now starting to dig up all this history and they want to make money off of it. Well, now he's deceased. Huh? He's yeah, deceased. Oh yeah, he died in 79. He, he can't make he can't take any checks to the No, he's not taking any checks well, to the bank. They, 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 they cash well, you know, especially with black artists. Like you yeah. definitely will get famous after, you know, that's what they would but we're you know we're gonna change that narrative. And um, but he was influential to artists like I mentioned Jack Lee. You know, Jack Whitten was a young artist who wanted to follow abstraction, who wanted to express himself in a more universalist perspective, and not just focus on, hey, you know, because I use yellow and red and big swaths of paint, it doesn't mean I'm not, you know, expressing my black experience. We're talking about the black experience. So black people themselves have allowed themselves to kind of, you know, stay in this, this, this trap of blackness. You know, like you said, like you mentioned earlier. But Norman Lewis, um, is a really pivotal figure because he was there at the time and he had the notoriety, but he was obviously cut off. And now that they're taking artists that are passing on, such as Jack Whitney, who's in his you know, 70s when he passed, he just passed a couple years ago, they're trying to market it and, and make money off of it. And I'm not gonna allow them to just do that. I wanna take this information and spread it so that people have a reason to go see art, have a reason to come to places like this to get their juju to get their creative fix and to believe inspired and to take the concepts that they get from here and apply it to their own lives in their own way to find that rhythm whatever it is they do like the art of business
business with my father, you know what I'm saying? The art of, you know what I'm saying, corporate work that you do and the stuff that you do out in the community service, you know, the work you do sonically and, you know, with your literature, you know, the work that Adrian does with building communities and providing spaces and places of organizing, you know, that's whatever your rhythm is. It's all, you know, connected. So Norman Lewis is, is, is hugely important in the fact that without people knowing, he had an impact on all those white artists in the group. Why is it that he can have an impact? Why is it that they took Jimmy and made him white? Why is it that they took John michelle Bastier and made him white? Why? Because black people aren't educated about their culture. We're educated about what we're told our culture is, what we tell people our culture is. We, we deny our own humanity when we try to lift our own blackness up. You can't date outside your own race. You can't be this, you can't be that. Why can't you? You are that. But we tell ourselves, oh, that's not being black. We provide our own prison because we're using their methods. We aren't existing and thinking out of that time. We're afraid to because it's driven by capitalism, which is driven by survival. You know, so don't step out of that paradigm and find any organic value. Don't find anything that, because if you think money makes you, it doesn't. The things that gave us life are free. So I'm gonna open myself to the abundance of the creative universe and allow that energy to pulse through me. And for the ancestors that have toiled and have worked from the East to Africa all the way to the shores of Virginia, that I'm going to honor that. And I'm going to express it. I will be proud of that. And I see that as what it really is, which is unlimited potential. And the constant, you know. I think about, I understand, like, you know, the ancestor concept, the right. ancestor worship. Um, people that I did my master's research on in Central America, you know, Guyana people. Right. Got me from the speaking people around Central America. Very, their whole cosmology and religious system is based on ancestor worship. They have three drums. They have a in their in their most sacred ceremony, the duke, they have these three drums. And I asked the Buya at Shah, I said, well, what's the significance of these three drums? He said, well, those are the three dimensions of time, the past, the present, and the future. They're all three drums, right? And I spent as much time thinking about his grandchildren, his great appointed five-year-old Kelly. Yeah. I think about his great grandchildren. I think about his great 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 grandchildren. I think about I think about the un, the quote unquote unborn. The way other people think about the ancestors. I think that I'm working for them. I'm thinking that you know, it's not ridiculous to think that their lives won't be marred by war and capitalism. And you know, like you know, just this little sunrise deviation here. It's like. You know, people talk about us out in the cosmos, and it ain't good for the most part. But they say two things. They say they got some pretty nice music. They got some pretty nice, and they don't mean just like, you know, jazz or great class. They mean like, yeah, yeah for, compared to what we got, they got some pretty nice stuff. We've all of the Tahitian music, the Appalachians, all that stuff, as long as it's authentic, it's real, it's pumping, we like it. Got a lot of water. Everything else is like, man, y'all just, you know, you a mess. What's up? What's up? You got so much going for you, and it's like so slow. Let's get to the good stuff. Let's get to the stuff where we really are in the future. Not our phones, our phones, our technology. It's like way over there. But we want to catch up. We want to be like that. We want to be advanced. We want to be doing something that isn't just repairing what, you know, what everybody else has already messed up. That's, you know. I'm not going to take the final word Oh, no, 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 I want to. But this has been fruitful for me, Bob, because it's like, um, thank you, man. You know, this is, this is, this is uh, a continuation of what we started in your house. And, uh, you know, this is transcribable. We can put this in the book. Yeah, man. Absolutely. <laughs> we will, man. We will. And I want to sincerely thank you for. We're working on a book. Where's the camera? This is for right, 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 right. the people. Hopefully, y'all can hear us. Um, and the book just needs the author part, the word part, just needs to be able to clear his life out so he can get that project. I read an excerpt of it. It's incredible. It's, incredible. it's a workbook. It's going to be a practical book. Yeah, practical. Yeah. And, and putting 
that at spin orders could be a part of what's held up. Yeah, and no, but I'm honored again to 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 be you know for you to ask me to, to work on the project and that you get the vision of what I'm doing. You see the sonic relationship, you know, like you get it, vision you see the relationship. And you know, I found that working with like-minded musicians has been more liberating because most of the artists I work with, you know, are, are musicians. It's and a feedback loop because when I see your work, it, it translates in my head into sound. Right. You know, and that's kind and of it's like I want I want to try that too. Right. You know? Right. Right. And that's what I'm hoping to inspire to get people to understand that you know they can express themselves for the sake of genuine health and, and wellness and, and understanding. We'll end it on that. We'll tie it up. Thank you, Adrian. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. T-shirts, Alter Destiny here. I'm rocking it. He has a fantastic book, The Art of Sun Ra. The Execution, forgive me, of Sun Ra. It's a fantastic book. It's volume two. The first volume is Sun Ra's Life, which means you got to do your own research in addition to reading this incredible book. So please support my brother Thomas. Please support Art and Noise and Adrian Ferguson and his wonderful wife Tammy as they create spaces for artists to come and grow. Give thanks. What's the